invite you to take your Bibles to Acts chapter 8. Chapter 8, beginning with verse 32 down through verse 40. I guess that's the end of the chapter. I would invite you in honor of God's word to please stand with me as we read this text. We'll read the text in unison. Acts chapter 8, verses 30 through 40. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this? of himself or of some other man. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities, till he came to Caesarea. Okay. Our God in heaven, we thank you for the, on, for the, for the privilege and the honor of being entrusted with the special truth of your gospel message. We recognize, God, that there are many different ways of, of sharing and declaring that truth. And as we consider our text this morning, I pray, God, that, that you will show us how simple it is to simply follow the leading of the Holy Spirit and to be that witness that you have asked us to be to all of the world. And so, God, as we consider this, we pray for strength and mind to be able to be attentive. We pray that your word would speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. You know, some people just have absolutely no problem starting a conversation. Perhaps you know of some people who just are, are naturally conversationalists, and yet there are other people who could meet someone, even someone they know and are quite familiar with. Like myself, if there's been times I would meet someone even 
the pastor of the church. I remember in Moncton, New Brunswick, one time I walked into the building and the pastor was standing there and I was just coming up the stairs, opened the door, and I looked at him. He looked at me and it, I was uncomfortable thinking, you know, there should be some kind of a greeting or conversation. And I didn't want, I, I had no words. I couldn't say a thing. And I ended up just walking by him and never said a word. Uh, I have sometimes had a very large significant problem starting a conversation. There are others in this world that are tripping over themselves so that they can't get anything out plainly, thinking they're getting ready to start a conversation, and they start three conversations at once. Uh, I don't know of anybody like that, but there are different levels of ability in starting conversations. And there are different ways and plans and routines that different people have in how to begin a conversation, an opening line. And of course, the weather is always the most common, the easiest. What do you think about the weather today? There's also opening lines that are natural regarding, you know, when someone's walking a dog. You know, pets are one of the easiest ways of opening up a conversation. Because you're talking about a pet. The pet knows nothing about your conversation, so they're not offended that you're talking about them. And the person that you're talking to has a vested interest in controlling and guiding and loving this pet. And as soon as you talk about their pet and how beautiful they are, you've instantly connected with something that's very close to their heart. Pets are just the most wonderful way of meeting strange people and having no problem engaging a conversation. Or having young children, you know, when you're walking through the park and there's a, a baby in the stroller. It doesn't matter who's pushing the stroller. Oh, there's a baby! Oh, isn't that baby so cute? All babies are cute, by the way. You just have to make sure you say they're cute in front of their mother. Um, but it, it's just the most natural and easy way to start a conversation. How about if you have a burden to share the gospel with someone, how do you start a conversation with a complete stranger? Sometimes that's not very easy. Honestly, I have had a very difficult time even feeling called to open a conversation with a complete stranger. That doesn't mean it's not appropriate or that I shouldn't. I know I should. I should be able and ready to share the gospel message with anybody I meet on the street. I know that's an open opportunity. But I wonder how often we start thinking that we ought to be obligated to doing something and yet we're not recognizing what opportunities the Holy Spirit is giving. Last week we talked about a, a spirit-led witness. We talked about part one of a spirit-led witness that is being led by the Spirit. And we saw how that the Holy Spirit had talked, had communicated somehow to Philip and had, had told Philip to go down to the south without even telling him where, except to just go down to this road that goes down into the desert. I want you to go down there and be ready for me. So he goes down there and, and there is this chariot driving down this road we're told it had come to Jerusalem for to worship and was returning and the Holy Spirit told Philip to go join himself to this chariot so in whatever direction Philip was doing was going he wasn't setting out to meet a complete stranger on purpose he was just doing what God told him to do and God had given him a direction and when Philip finally recognized an opportunity. Here's this chariot with a man in it. And even the Holy Spirit had to tell Philip to go near and join himself to this chariot. The Holy Spirit had directed Philip. 
Philip found it was a specific call. It was an urge that he got from the Holy Spirit to go near this chariot. Now, it's a complete stranger. But in the process of following and obeying the direction of the Holy Spirit, Philip found himself in a place where his next perception was, I hear this Ethiopian man reading. I think he's reading from the book of Isaiah. Yes, I can hear what he's reading. He's reading from the book of Isaiah. And then the light dawns on Philip, perhaps for the first time, that this is a witnessing opportunity. He didn't know why perhaps he was going down to this road, going down into the desert. I suppose maybe he, had, he thought, maybe he had that, that righteous sense that everywhere he goes and everybody he talks to, he's going to share the gospel message with them. How normal and natural is that for us? I pass by a lot of strangers, and I honestly don't feel called of the Holy Spirit to stop them and to engage their conversation. But the Holy Spirit gave Philip this opportunity, and when we find ourselves in a position where we begin to perceive that there is an understanding question, or there is a consideration of the scriptures involved, or there is an opportunity simply to start a conversation. How do we begin? In Philip's case, he heard this man reading the scriptures, and his opening line of conversation was, Hey, I, I hear you reading from Isaiah. Do you understand what you're reading? That was one very similar opportunity I had way back, oh, must have been 35 years ago or so, somewhere along there, where I had, uh, I had been flagged by a neighbor over the backyard fence, saying, hi, how are you? I said, hi, we're doing fine. And conversation built up. I had no intention of sharing the gospel. It was just a conversation over the backyard fence. And the conversation became, would you like to come over and see my porch? We can sit on the porch, enjoy the fresh breeze, and just kind of, you know, visit. No problem. And the processing of visiting with him, I still had no sense that I was there to talk about the scriptures or the word of God of any sort. And he's, he's asking me questions. I'm just being friendly over the backyard fence. And he's asking me about, you know, what does my father do? Well, my father was a preacher. He, and, uh, okay, he, well, he knows a lot about preachers. So he's asking me, well, have you ever considered following your father's footsteps? I said, no, I've, I've just been, you know, working a, a software job. Was I working a software job? Yeah. I, I'm trying to keep my chronology straight, and it doesn't always work well for me. But I, I told him, that, you know, I was just a, a layman. I've taught Sunday school. I've done a few other things in the church, but I've never been a preacher. Then it began to dawn on me that maybe this was an opportunity. And I simply put out the line. But I do enjoy helping people understand the Word of God. Somehow, to that point, the Holy Spirit had to do an awful lot of circumstantial direction to place me in that position, even without my thinking intentionally of doing so, to the point where I finally recognized, hey, wake up, here it is. And when I suggested answering questions about the scriptures, he said, well, you know, it's a funny thing. I have a lot of questions. I wish you could answer some questions. And you see how wonderful the Holy Spirit works. We don't have to carry about a guilt trip mentality that says, oh, I just passed another stranger. I wonder if I was supposed to speak to him. Oh, there goes somebody else. I wonder if I should have spoken to him. If the Holy Spirit is leading you and you are sensitive to the Holy Spirit, he will give you opportunity. 
And when we recognize the opportunity, whether we're hearing the scriptures or a question is asked, our answers and our conversation <coughs> should always have in it the recognition that we are a believer in Jesus Christ. And when conversation comes around to circumstances, what is the difference between us and someone else in the world? Well, well, we have a faith in Jesus Christ. Well, well I believe too. And, you know, conversation can go in a number of different directions, but we are simply always ready. So what I would like to discuss regarding this spirit-led witness, this part two of it, is not so much the consideration of the Holy Spirit leading, but on the actual witness part. I want to focus on the witness of the believer as we look at these verses from Acts chapter 8. Philip's opening line was, do you understand the Bible? And I think the first statement I will make of application here is this. All scripture points to Jesus. And I believe that becomes important and I could have used this one phrase because I was talking to someone the other day and he was showing me his business card that had a little symbol on it and he, and he explained to me this symbol uh, represents five things, five different letters were placed in the symbol and the first one was faith. Ding! I heard the word faith. He's showing me his business card in a symbol that has something about faith on it. And so, you know, my natural reaction, oh, you're talking about faith, faith in what? And all of a sudden the conversation is started. I didn't ask him to come over so I could witness to him. But I engaged the conversation about faith and we recognized that our faith is necessary. He said, well, I said, faith in what? He said, well, faith in God. Okay, well, there's a lot of people that have faith in God, but... What is it about God that we believe? And, and he, he mentioned something about Jesus died for our sins. Okay, well, this is a good direction. He understands faith, and we're now talking about salvation. But my, my, my next step was, okay, well, you know, I'm not going to lead you to under, I'm not going to explain to you that Jesus died for our sins. You already know that. But in, in the moment of that time, I didn't quite think about where I was going next, and I don't think that the Holy Spirit necessarily intended that I should go anywhere next, but maybe to wait for the next time we might meet. I don't know how the Holy Spirit works. I know that the Holy Spirit tells us not to be anxious about what we're going to say when we are uh, dragged to be a witness even before kings. And I have had many occasions where I can look back on it and I can see where it was very much necessary to get to that point and then leave it alone instead of trying to hammer on somebody. The next time you come together, they will have thought about what was said the last time. So in this consideration, we recognize that all scripture points to Jesus. So the next phase in that conversation, you believe that Christ died for our sins. Well, that's great. What does the scripture teach us about salvation. And as soon as you can bring anything to the scriptures, you can point people to Jesus Christ because I believe every verse of scripture in the Bible, either in its context or in its direct declaration, has something to do with pointing people to Jesus Christ. Whether it's in the Old Testament and all the sacrifices pointing to uh, the Messiah that was to come, or whether it's in the New Testament, even talking about the book of Revelation and the things that are coming in the future because of God's judgment on this world, because of sin, and all of that is based on God's plan of salvation for those who trust in Jesus Christ as their Savior. I believe all Scripture, in one way or another, can point others to Jesus Christ. I recognize here what Philip did in Acts chapter 8 when he heard the book of Isaiah being read. And it even quotes what he heard being read. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. 
And we see down in verse 35 that having heard the dialogue, having asked the question, and the, the eunuch saying, I need someone to explain this, Philip, in verse 35, opened his mouth to speak. And he began at the same scripture. It's sometimes difficult to know where someone is in their understanding of scripture. So the best way I can think of is to simply ask them, where are you at? What do you understand? And as soon as you hear some statement of understanding about the scripture, if you know what the scripture says, you can either confirm it or you can encourage them to understand differently if you know what the scripture says. But Philip, recognizing that he was reading from this book in Isaiah, was able to start at the same place where this man was. One time as I was studying at the Bible Institute in Moncton, I had occasion to go down to the, uh, the local prison and have a prison ministry. So I went down to the prison, I talked to the, to the chaplain, and I had arranged an opportunity to meet with some of the prisoners if they were willing and wanted to, to have a Bible study. And so, as I was preparing for the Bible study, the pastor of the church who was uh, directing my ministry there as I was studying, asked me what I was preparing to preach, or was preparing to teach or use as a Bible study. And I told him that my plan of action was this. I was intending to go down there and ask them what do they understand about the Bible. And to start with wherever they are and to show them Jesus Christ. So that as an opening line, recognizing that all scripture points to Jesus, you should be able to start just about anywhere in scripture, wherever somebody is at in scripture, and point them to Jesus Christ. How does that particular scripture connect with the context of Jesus Christ having created the world without sin, and having planned to redeem sinners from their sin, and all of what is being projected for judgment and mercy, everything should be able to point others to Christ, starting anywhere in the scriptures. Where was he at in the, the eunuch? He was reading this place of the scripture from the book of Isaiah. In fact, my reference work says that he was quoting from Isaiah chapter 53, verses 7 and 8. And it's interesting to recognize that this Ethiopian man, this eunuch, was attracted to this particular section of scripture as he was attracted to this whole concept of the suffering servant. Recognizing there was a point of identification with this Ethiopian man. Think about it in reference to what was said about the Savior, Jesus Christ. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. And like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. That would have been a difficult spot to be in. And for whatever reason, this Ethiopian man may have been made a eunuch. It was a position of being humiliated. Verse 33, recognizing in Jesus, in his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Jesus was humiliated in the way he was treated and unmercifully tried and punished. His judgment was taken away. There was no justice being applied for Jesus Christ when he was being tried. It was completely trumped up. It was completely bogus. And everything, even the, the, even Pilate himself said there's nothing in him to be condemned. But that judgment was not available for Jesus Christ. He was taken away, and then it says, who shall declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth? 
Well, this eunuch, perhaps, and there's a reason why we understand that he's being a eunuch, he's attracted to this verse, because he recognizes that his generation will never be declared. So this, this eunuch is identifying with his suffering servant in many different ways, quite personally, perhaps. So whatever it is that draws the world to the scriptures, we should be able to take them from that point of connection and show them Jesus Christ in the scriptures. The eunuch was able to answer him and say, this is what Jesus Christ did. We have now seen it, in fact, uh, he, what he explains when he, Philip would have explained what the eunuch was reading when the eunuch read he was led as a sheep to the slaughter. We recognize as this pertains to Jesus Christ, he was led as a sheep very calmly. Jesus did not resist being drawn away. Jesus was willingly led away to his crucifixion. Like a lamb that was dumb before his shearers, Jesus did not resist the arrest. His humiliation could be referring to the fact that Jesus Christ came down from his heavenly glory to take on the form of a servant in the form of man. It could also be referring to the fact that he was so brutally and unfairly treated and tried in his justice. And similarly, the phrase that his justice, judgment was taken away. He was being unjustly tried. And then his life was taken from the earth. We recognize that Christ was crucified. But Philip was able to start there and explain how this refers to Jesus Christ. And then he fills him in on the rest of the story. We'll go to Acts chapter 2 and verses 22 to 24 how we recognize the rest of the story as these, as these uh, apostles had recognized and as I believe this is Peter speaking to the leaders of the Jews and to the people of the Jews Peter is saying in Acts chapter 2 verse 22 that's right it says, ye men of Israel, he hear these words that Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved by God, approved of God among you, approved by miracles and wonders and signs, whom God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. This is what has happened presently. This is what the eunuch was being informed of regarding Jesus Christ whom God has raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be pulled in of it. Jesus Christ both died and rose again. Down to verse 32 in Acts chapter 2. Then Jesus, this Jesus, hath God raised up, wherefore we, whereof we all are witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this which ye now see and hear. What is it about Jesus Christ? Not only was he predicted to be crucified and cut off, but also, as we have seen, this same Jesus, God had intended to be put to death, has been crucified, but has also been raised to life and is now at the right hand of the Father. And down to verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made this same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. So you can see how the, this, the teaching and understanding of who Jesus Christ is was a natural follow-up to what he was reading in the Scripture. And then you have this completed story. God is righteous. Man is sinful. Sin will be judged in hell. And all of these things fit so conveniently into this whole concept of Jesus being crucified, risen again, and ascended into heaven. Sin will be judged in hell. And God provided Jesus to take our judgment upon himself. These are the standard black and white principles that we understand about salvation. 
what happened in Acts chapter 2 as a result of declaring the word of God when they understood and heard the word of God then they were pricked in their heart then the Holy Spirit through the word of God did a work in their heart to convict them and to draw them to an intention of understanding and that's my next point not only does all scripture point to Jesus but an understanding of Scripture brings conviction. And that is where we understand our role in helping someone to understand the Scriptures. And when they understand the Scriptures, then it is up to the Holy Spirit to bring about a point of conviction. And as the conversation goes forward, it becomes very obvious. When it begins to take hold in their heart, and they begin to understand the scriptures, the Holy Spirit brings about that conviction. That's not something that we do. That's not our responsibility. I know many times we can share the word of God with somebody, and we can say, oh, I wish they could just get it. I wish they would understand it. I wish they would come to Christ. But you know what? That's not our job. That's the work of the Holy Spirit in their heart. And when we try and struggle and, and hurt ourselves in thinking that we ought to be able to bring someone to Christ, no, we can't do that. But if we are faithfully representing Jesus Christ, and if we are faithfully representing the Scriptures and explaining the Scriptures correctly, if we are explaining what we know about the Scriptures as the Holy Spirit brings it to our mind, then the Holy Spirit will work in the heart of the ones to whom we are witnessing, and we hope that the Holy Spirit will bring about that conviction and draw them to the Lord. And that brings us to our third point that I'm going to make this morning. If the understanding of the word brings conviction to the heart of the unbeliever, then it is man's will that reveals God's power. It is man's response to that conviction that reveals the working of the power of God in the heart of the unbeliever. The power of God unto salvation is this that people should repent and be baptized. We saw in the end of Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, this is what was being preached. Peter, having preached to them Jesus, having told them that Jesus was crucified and risen again and is now both Lord and Christ, the people heard the word of God and they were pricked in their heart. And then the work of the Holy Spirit was revealed when they said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized. If the Holy Spirit is convicting somebody and they recognize that they are a sinner, what should they do? Not that anything that they do is going to bring about the salvation, because I believe, and I believe Scripture would support, that if they are at the point of conviction, the Holy Spirit has already woken them up. What they need to do now is to respond to the Holy Spirit. Having believed that Christ died for their sins, they now need to respond in a way that we recognize that the Lord is working. Even if we don't recognize it, the Lord is still working. But in order to continue the process of coming to the Lord and growing in Christ, there are a number of things. One of the things that is mentioned even here in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, is to repent. Recognizing that if Christ died for sin, he died for your sin. And yours, yours is the sin that needs to be repented of. One cannot repent of sin without the Holy Spirit giving them the power to understand and to do so. Nobody's going to repent of sin if they don't believe that that's what they need to do. So when someone repents of sin, it reveals the fact that God is working in their lives. When they repent, when they are baptized, 
And when they continue to grow in the Lord, that is all a revelation. It's man's will being expressed, and it's God's power being revealed that the Holy Spirit is doing his work. So we look for man's response. Not that man's response is what brings about the salvation, but man's response is what reveals God's power and helps us to know where we can next lead them in helping them to understand the process of growth. And that brings me to the final point that I want to make, in that the first direction that God gives us after we uh, express, after we have a, a faith in Jesus Christ, and we recognize our sin, and that Christ came to take that sin upon himself to take it away from us, the first thing that we are instructed to do by the scriptures is to illustrate that in the waters of baptism. Baptism is God's first command for a believer to demonstrate and to activate his own will to reveal God's power. And that is why our church constitution, in terms of asking people to be a member of our church, or if people are asking to be a member of our church, our constitution tells us that they, that we have agreed that the Bible says that they ought to be believers in Jesus Christ and they ought to be baptized. Why do we require baptism in order to qualify for membership in the church? Because that is the first act of a man's will that demonstrates their obedience to the working of the Holy Spirit. Being willing to be baptized, uh, following through with God's command, and then after that there are many other things that God asks us to do. So baptism is one of the first things that was practiced, and God tells us that this is what we should do as we make disciples. We should be baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then this was the practice of the New Testament church in recognizing those who had followed the Lord, had their faith in the Lord. So as we get to in, in the end of Acts chapter 8, verses 37 and 38, we recognize where the eunuch, having desired to accept Jesus and recognizing that he was, um, he was receiving the, the word of God, he was believing what was being told to him, as he was believing in Jesus Christ as, he was, as it was presented to him. There's probably many other things that Philip was able to fill him in on. I am sure that Philip told him a lot more than just what we read in our text. It says that Philip was able to start at that scripture and preach unto him Jesus. Well, the concept of preaching Jesus, like the, the entire rest of the story, is all, is all part of it. Somewhere along the line, it was obvious that baptism was a part of recognizing and representing our faith in Jesus Christ. And if that's what Philip was preaching, then this eunuch said, well, I believe what you're telling me. Well, here's water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? Have I got this right? Do I understand right? That, that you know, baptism is a, a natural representation of, of our faith in Christ. Philip says, you got it. You understand it. And as Philip took him down into the waters and baptized him, we recognize that there is a verse in the middle there that says, in verse 37, it says, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. That was Philip's question to him. And he asked about being baptized. And, and that is the common question that we have here. I had someone... Uh, across the river here in Augusta asked me about, he said he wanted to be baptized. And I said, okay, well, well, let's get together and talk about the scripture and make sure we understand what baptism is. And of course, that quickly revealed the fact that he was uh, on his own agenda regarding baptism. He didn't really believe in Jesus Christ. So that was the end of that conversation. 
But in verse 37, Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may be baptized. And, and he expressed the faith in Christ by stating, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And thus, he was taken down and being baptized. Now, this is one reason why I prefer the King James over, for example, the English Standard Version of the Scriptures, because if you look in the ESV Bible, you will not find verse 37. I don't fully understand all of why the translators or the, the editors of the ESV Scriptures did not include verse 37. But even if we took 37 out of this text, there are so many other scripture texts that support and say the same thing that if we believe in our heart. In fact, Romans 10, 9 and 10 tells us that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth Confession is made unto salvation. That doesn't mean that the confession is what brought about salvation, but the confession is another one of those acts of the man's will that reveals the power of God. And the concept of being baptized is dependent on our faith in Jesus Christ. So we get to this one point of the conversation that we all desire to bring anybody to if we ever have the opportunity is the concept of recognizing our sin and believing that Christ died for our sin. And the, the title on the slide can change a number of different ways. In this case, I've put the title on it, How to Reveal God's Power. It's the same thing in accepting Christ. It's the same concept of recognizing you're a sinner and believing that Christ died for your sins. When man expresses that, when man is able to accomplish admission and believing that Christ died for his sins, that is a revelation of the power of God working in his heart. And that is the object that we want to get to. And of course, we've also seen this one. As a believer in Jesus Christ, there are some things that people ought to do, and the scripture supports that we should invite Jesus to live in our heart. We should be open about it, and that's not that he isn't already there. The Holy Spirit is already dwelling within, but the invitation is, is to express, to have a, an expression of man's will, to say, Lord, you are invited to be there and stay there. I want you there. It's not just coming in to take over my life, but I want you to be there. That's good. We want to turn away from sin, and we want to be yielded in our life to Jesus Christ because of this whole concept that Christ died for our sin. As well, reading our Bible, talking about Jesus, and then I got towards the bottom of this, asking about being baptized and joining the local body of believers. This is all part of the scriptural consideration of what it means to be a believer in Jesus Christ, right through to the point of being connected with a local body of believers and growing in Christ, and then learning how we too can be a witness to draw others to Jesus Christ as well. So before we, we go to prayer, like to ask us each to consider where are we at in our understanding of what it means to be a witness. The book that we use as our textbook is the Bible because all Bible points to Jesus Christ in some way. Every verse of scripture can be placed in context and in its overall context can reveal Jesus Christ. Also, an understanding of the Bible brings about conviction. And then man's response reveals the God's power. And this is how the cycle continues. We believe in Christ. We are baptized. We join the church. We become a witness. We bring someone else to understand their faith in Christ so that they can be baptized and, and join 
a church and grow in Christ and, and follow all the, ins, the uh, implications of Scripture. And the cycle continues. And that is how the church grows. That is how God designed the church to function. And I would simply ask, where are you at in that process? And would you, as we go to prayer, would you ask the Lord to reveal to you what is the next step in our growth in the Lord that God would have us to make? Let us pray. Our God in heaven, we are grateful for your Holy Spirit working in our hearts. We are grateful for the word of God that you have given to us that reveals to us who you are and what you expect of mankind. And Lord, we are grateful for those who have come along beside of us to help us to understand the scriptures and our need to respond to your Holy Spirit drawing on our hearts. And Lord, as we've understood the requirements of believers to be baptized and to grow and to fellowship together. We, we recognize, God, that there are, are a number of things that we ought to be doing. And we pray that you would reveal those to us. Help us, Lord, to desire to be all that you expect us to be. And I pray, God, that as we have opportunity, as we recognize that the Holy Spirit has placed us in a certain position. Help us, Lord, to be ready and willing to talk about how your scriptures will point people to Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.